Hey everyone, I'm Cassius and welcome back to the Shakespeare Minute. Well, it was only going to be so long that I could hold out. Today, we go beyond the bard, discussing for the first time a play not by Shakespeare, but from the Shakespeare era, the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd. Okay, so I love this play, I directed it, blah blah blah. But what the heck is it, and why do I love it so much? Well, The Spanish Tragedy by Thomas Kidd is none other than the first modern revenge drama, and one of the first, if not the first, modern tragedy. Based largely on the tropes from the Roman tragedian Seneca, the Spanish tragedy set the tone for later tragedies of the era and has obvious influence over Titus Andronicus and Hamlet. The first reaction that a lot of people get upon reading the Spanish tragedy is a sense that either Shakespeare or Kidd ripped the other off, because this play is a lot like Hamlet. I mean, it does feature a ghost, a story of revenge in a court where the villains smile like per perfectly sane people, there's a climactic play within a play scene, of course, and there is an insanely high body count. Also, it features a man who is driven to near or feigned madness under the pressure of figuring out how to take his revenge. So, you know, nothing like Hamlet at all. So let's do a mini plot summary here. I'm not going to apologize for spoilers, mostly since the likelihood of you getting within a thousand miles of a production of this play is damn tiny. I recommend it on the page too though, but to discuss it we will need to take a moment to look at the plot and the characters. So here goes, and my apologies for the craziness. During the now-concluded war between Spain and Portugal, a Spanish courtier-slash-soldier, Don Andrea, has been killed by the Prince of Portugal, Don Balthazar. Balthazar was captured by Andrea's friend, Horatio, when Portugal lost, but the Spanish Prince, Lorenzo, also lays claim to the prisoner. Oh yeah, there's also a guy named Horatio in this. He's a kind young man who acts out of love for a friend who has died, so you know, nothing like that other Horatio. The dead Andrea returns to watch the living, with the spirit of revenge following him and promising that he will eventually see the downfall of the Prince of Portugal who killed him. Horatio's heroism wins the heart of Andrea's former lover and Lorenzo's sister, Bella Imperia, the Princess of Spain, but her father, the Duke of Castile, and her uncle, the King, want to marry her off to Balthazar to cement the truce that concluded the war. Since he killed her first lover, though, she's not particularly interested. Lorenzo, that's Bella Imperia's brother and the Prince of Spain, for those of you not keeping track, decides that to cement the truce for sure, he'll kill Horatio, thus forcing his sister to marry the Portuguese prince. He, Balthazar, and their two servants kill Horatio, forcing Geronimo, Horatio's father and a chief justice type figure, into the play. He spends the rest of the play figuring out how to navigate the world of the court while trying to find out who killed his son. And once he realizes just how high up the guilty parties are in the court pecking order, trying to plot their deaths. How he does this, I will leave as an exercise for the reader, for that is the end of the play and I don't want to give everything away, but suffice it to say there's a lot of death. And he teams up with the horrified and toweringly angry Bell Imperia in the process, making Bell Imperia one of the more active, empowered female figures I've seen in this era of tragedy. The main difference between this play and Hamlet is that the morality in the Spanish tragedy is much more black and white. This is a classical, not Christian moral schematic. We have the Greek and Roman gods here, not the New Testament forgiving Jesus God. That means if you're a bad person and you die, there is no hope for a conversion. There is no possibility that you will pray away your sins, that you will be forgiven. Revenge won't taint your killer either. If you deserved it, they can kill you. End of story. Men can take justice into their own hands if the courts and the heavens won't give it to them. And this heady, amoral message is gripping, but it is certainly not 
Hamlet. This means that ultimately Hieronimo, while a thrilling main character with lots of Hamlet-ish qualities, isn't a tragic hero. He never has the tragic error that Hamlet does. He spends most of his time figuring out who his son's killers are. This is something that Hamlet doesn't have to do, this whole logistical plot of figuring out who to go after. And then he just verifies his intel and sets up a completely nutter's plan to execute his revenge. In fact, this play isn't the tragedy of any individual character, but rather the tragedy of Spain itself, as Spain itself is the entity that has the arrogance, which after a great victory, leaves it ready for a great fall. That said, the play is incredible. Hieronimo's speeches predict Hamlet's in so many ways. You know this speech here? To be or not to be. Yeah, we have suicidal tendencies in Hieronimo's speeches too. Hieronimo also has a moment where he sees a ghost of his son that no one else sees. You know, this old man comes to him at, with a case of his murdered son, since Hieronimo is a justice, and Hieronimo starts to see this old man as his son instead of a citizen with a case for him. Uh, Bell Imperia, as I was saying, the Spanish princess, is a shocking female character, unlike any Shakespeare heroine you've ever seen. Unlike any of Shakespeare's young romantic heroines, she has had another lover in the past, and she is still desirable as a love interest and a compelling secondary protagonist, despite not falling into the typical maid-wife-widow dynamic so cleanly. She is technically in the widow category because her former lover is now dead, but she definitely comes across as the romantic character that we can desire and feel for. She also calls the shots in her relationship, and it's much more her story than that of her luckless lover, Horatio. She does sacrifice herself for love at the end, but she aims her emotions rather than submits to them, and she also gets one of the end of play on stage revenge kills herself solo. And that on stage killing is something that Shakespearean women almost never do. Okay, Regan kills a no name servant in Lear, and Margaret, with the help of a few men, kills her nemesis in Henry VI, Part Three. This is cooler. The vicious violence and bitter amorality of the Spanish tragedy caused it to fall from favor into relative obscurity over the centuries. But right at the time of its writing, it was the single biggest tragedy in England for decades, throughout Shakespeare's time writing as well. When Richard Burbage died, that great actor who originated the role of Hamlet, along with many others, his elegy began, No More Young Hamlet, Old Hieronimo, since these were two roles that he had played. Hieronimo was listed second only to Hamlet, and the other roles listed from Shakespeare come later on in the poem. This play was huge, and for good reason. The world of the play is dark and vicious in an incredibly over-the-top yet honestly horrifying way. The villains are mind-bogglingly evil, and the mourning from the various characters is soaringly beautiful. Also, the idea that people might take justice into their own hands is incredibly empowering and really speaks to a kind of Renaissance-era view of going back to the classical way of thinking. Honestly, you might, as a Shakespeare fan, think that such heady, vicious violence is kind of beneath us, but the revenge drama continues to be compelling to the Western psyche in a big way, and the first modern example of that kind of plot is a damn fine entry into the genre. I have linked in the video description to a place where you can read this play online, and I've also linked to a YouTube video of Derek Jacobi as Hieronimo in a reading of part of the play. I believe it's the mid-act three to the end, if everything that I saw there is still there. Uh, and it's a screenplay that was not ultimately produced, but it's really fun to see Derek Jacobi and a few other people reading these roles, which are not performed all that often. So, for our first episode of Beyond the Bard, I am Cassius with the Shakespeare Minute. Till next time, think of the world.